Hello and welcome to the module Introduction to Aerosols. My name is Gurumurthy Ramachandran and I am a faculty member at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health in the Division of Environmental Health Sciences. By the end of this module, learners should be able to do the following. Define the term aerosol and other related terms. Interpret summary properties of particle distributions. Predict the relationship between aerosol sources and the resulting particle sizes. And finally, describe various approaches to measuring airborne particles. In everyday usage, the term aerosol refers to a product such as a perfume, paint, or a pharmaceutical delivered in the form of a spray or mist from a container with a liquid and a propellant inside it, as shown in this diagram. However, the word aerosol has a much broader definition. We can define an aerosol as a suspension of liquid or solid particles in a gas. The sizes of aerosol particles span a wide range. They can be as small as one thousandth of a micrometer or one nanometer. To put this in perspective, one nanometer is roughly two to five times larger than the size of small gas molecules. At the upper end, particles can be as large as 100 to 200 micrometers. There are a number of sources that generate aerosol particles, both natural and man-made. This picture shows some of the sources of naturally occurring aerosols, including volcanic emissions on the right-hand side, smoke from forest fires, volatile organic chemical emissions from plants, and these emissions then undergo chemical reactions to form particles, dust from desert sandstorms, and emissions of dimethyl sulfide from the plankton in oceans that then undergo further reactions to form sulfate particles or sulfate aerosol. Aerosols are responsible for the beautiful red sunsets that we have all seen the annual forest fires in the western United States. They cause farther away hills to appear lighter than nearer hills due to the scattering of light by aerosol particles. Rainbows are observed due to the interaction of sunlight with water droplets suspended in air. And of course the smoke and ash from volcanic eruptions as we have mentioned before. Aerosols are also created by human activities. For example, the very fine particles and fumes that are generated during welding at high temperatures, the much larger dust particles that are generated when we cut a piece of concrete using a mechanical saw, the smoke from industrial smokestacks, the fine mist that is generated when we spray a field with pesticides from an airplane, the smoke when we grill a piece of meat, and of course cigarette smoke. It is useful to get a sense of the range of particle sizes of aerosols from different sources. As we discussed before, aerosol sizes can range from one thousandth of a micrometer or one nanometer to roughly 100 to 200 micrometers. So this covers around five orders of magnitude. To put this in perspective, we can relate this order of magnitude range to the range of sizes from a P to a very large building. When blown dusts are created by mechanical processes such as erosion of rocks over geological time scales, and these have particles in the range of roughly one micrometer to several hundred micrometers. Mining dusts are also created by mechanical processes such as the crushing of ore bearing rocks and these have roughly the same size range, slightly less than a micrometer to around 100 micrometers. The lengths of asbestos fibers are also between 1 micrometer to around 100 micrometers. Biological spores are also roughly in this size range. The sizes of airborne bacteria cover a smaller range from around a half a micrometer 
to around 10 micrometers. What is commonly referred to as the urban aerosol is made of emissions of particles from vehicles of various kinds, emissions from industrial sources such as power plants, and particles created by chemical reactions between gases such as ozone and volatile organic chemicals. The range of these particles is from around 50 nanometers or 0.05 micrometer to around 5 micrometers. Metal smelting fumes range from around 10 nanometers to around 500 nanometers. Vehicular exhaust, also a result of combustion reaction, is roughly in the same size range. Viruses range from around 10 nanometers to 100 nanometers in size. We commonly refer to particles less than a micrometer or 1000 nanometers as fine particles. Particles less than 100 nanometers are called ultrafine. This is also the range of what we call nanoparticles although this term typically refers only to particles that have been intentionally created in an engineering process. To get a perspective of these small sizes, it is useful to remember that the width of the human hair is about 70 to 75 micrometers. The wavelengths of colors in the visible spectrum of light range from around 380 to 780 nanometers. In addition to size, particles come in a wide variety of shapes, ranging from fibers where we have the length of particles much greater than the width of the fibers, to chain agglomerates that are made of chains of small particles. Particles can be spherical, in various crystalline shapes. Pollen come in a variety of shapes with interesting surface features. Water droplets are roughly spherical. And all these shapes, where the length and width and height of the particles are roughly the same, although not exactly the same, are called isometric. Unlike fibers that have one dimension, such as the length, much larger than another, such as the height or width. This slide shows the array of shapes associated with nanoparticles with the same composition. All these particles even though they have very different shapes, have the same composition chemically. They are all made of zinc oxide, and this illustrates the range of shapes that nanoparticles can take. Another important property of particles is their density. Depending on their composition, particle density can vary widely. Water droplets have a density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. The metal lead has a density of 11,300 kilograms per cubic meter. It is useful to compare these with the density of air, which is roughly 1 kilogram per cubic meter. So water has a density that is almost 1,000 times greater than that of air. The physical and chemical processes that generate aerosol particles determine the range of particle sizes. In mechanical processes, energy is supplied to a bulk material to break it into smaller particles. For example, during cutting, blasting, or crushing for solid particles, or spraying in the case of liquid particles, the sizes of the particles depend on the ratio of the amount of energy supplied and the energy of the adhesive bonds holding the parent material together. Now we will watch three videos that show aerosol generation from various mechanical processes. The three processes that we will see now are cutting off a concrete block, a coal mining operation, and finally spray painting. In this video, a worker is using a saw to cut through a piece of concrete and generating dust in the process. Here we see a diesel operated vehicle dumping crushed coal onto a pile. So some of the particles are mechanically generated coal dust, 
but we can also see the black diesel combustion smoke being emitted by the vehicle. This smoke is made of much smaller particles than the coal dust and this is an example of a mixed aerosol. In this video we see a car being sprayed with a liquid paint. The hose supplies high pressure air to the liquid in the container and breaks it up into very small spray droplets. Particles can also be created by molecular processes such as those shown in this slide. Molecules of a vapor or gas can come together by themselves to form small clusters in a process called nucleation. This can happen when a gas that is saturated with a vapor undergoes rapid cooling and thus creates conditions for these nuclei to form. These nuclei are roughly the size of a nanometer. An example is the formation of primary soot particles from the tailpipe emissions of vehicles. Once these nuclei are formed, they can continue to increase in size by colliding and sticking to each other, a process called coagulation. They may increase in size by condensation, that is molecules of the vapor condense onto the surface of particles, or decrease in size by evaporation, that is molecules leave the particle surface. Thus, once an aerosol is created, either mechanically or by nucleation, its particles can change in size by these mechanisms. These phenomena play an important role in the exposure to aerosols that human beings face. Depending on where people are located with respect to these phenomena, they would be exposed to different aerosol sizes and concentrations. To summarize what we have learned so far, chemical processes such as combustion, welding, and those in nanoparticle reactors lead to particle sizes less than one micrometer in size and frequently less than a tenth of a micrometer or 100 nanometers in size. These are referred to as ultrafine or nanoparticles. Mechanical processes, on the other hand, such as grinding or sanding, lead to much larger sizes, ranging from one micrometer to several hundred micrometers. The concept of an equivalent diameter is very important in describing particle sizes. It is easy to see that two spherical particles with the same diameter, for example, an air bubble and a lead particle, will behave very differently in air. Likewise, particles with different shapes could behave similarly under some conditions. How can we describe the sizes of particles when they come in different shapes and chemical and physical properties? In defining an equivalent diameter, we first imagine a spherical particle and then we keep some property unchanged, that is invariant between the real particle and the imaginary sphere. And then we describe the real particle in terms of the diameter of this imaginary sphere. In other words, the equivalent diameter is the diameter of the sphere that has the same value of a physical property as that of the particle in question. In this slide, we have an actual particle that is irregularly shaped and is made of a material with a density rows of p. How can we describe the size of this irregularly shaped particle? We can imagine several different physical properties that we can use as the basis for defining an equivalent diameter. For example, we can imagine a sphere with the same projected surface area as our actual particle. And we think of the projected surface area of a particle as the area of the shadow cast by the particle on a projection screen. And then the diameter of this sphere is the projected surface area equivalent diameter. Alternatively, you can imagine a sphere with the same total surface area as the surface area of the actual particle. The diameter of this sphere is the surface area equivalent diameter. We can also imagine a sphere with the same volume 
as our actual particle. The diameter of this sphere is the volume equivalent diameter. As a final example, we can imagine a spherical water droplet with the same speed of falling through air, also known as its terminal settling velocity, as our actual particle. The diameter of this water droplet is called the aerodynamic equivalent diameter, or simply the aerodynamic diameter. We will learn about the aerodynamic diameter in greater detail in a later module. Next, we discuss the topic of particle size distributions. A monodispersed aerosol is one in which all the particles are of the same size. It is almost never found in nature, and it is artificially constructed or engineered in very highly controlled circumstances. And it's very difficult to make monodispersed aerosols. A polydispersed aerosol, on the other hand, is one in which there is a range of particle sizes. Almost all natural and workplace aerosols are polydispersed. Now we will discuss the statistics of particle size distributions. At a very basic level, if we have a collection of a number of particles with different diameters, then we can calculate the mean and standard deviation of the particle sizes. The arithmetic mean diameter is a measure of the central tendency of the distribution of particle sizes. If capital N is the total number of particles in a sample or collection of particles, and N sub i is the number of particles with size d sub i, then the arithmetic mean is calculated using this formula, where we multiply each size d sub i by the number of particles with that size n sub i and then summing this over all particle sizes. This sum of the products is then divided by the total number of particles, capital N or summation of n sub i, to yield the average diameter or the arithmetic mean diameter denoted by d hat. The median diameter is the value below which 50% of the particle diameters are and above which 50% of the particles lie. It is thus the 50th percentile of particle diameters. The standard deviation of particle sizes is calculated using this formula. We find the difference between each particle size from the arithmetic mean diameter, square the difference, multiply this by the number of particles of that size, n sub i, and then sum this across all the size ranges and take this sum and divide this by the total number of particles minus 1. After that, we take the square root of this quantity. The standard deviation is a measure of the variability in particle size. Let us consider an aerosol where we have been able to determine some equivalent diameter for a large number of particles using some aerosol measurement instrument. The instrument in this example counts and classifies the particles into seven size ranges or size bends as shown here, 10 to 50 nanometers, 50 to 80 nanometers, and so on all the way up to 890 to 1260 nanometers. The total number of particles counted is 832. We want to calculate the arithmetic mean, the median, and standard deviation of this collection of particles. But from this table, it looks like we only know the ranges within which the particle sizes lie and not each individual particle's size. Therefore, we will make a simplifying assumption. We will assume that within each size bin, all the particles are of the same size. And we will further assume that this is the midpoint of the size bin. Although this is an assumption, it is not too far from the truth, and so it is a justifiable assumption. We can now add a third column to our table that lists the midpoint diameter for each size range. This allows us to calculate the various terms 
needed to calculate the arithmetic average. Now the fourth column is obtained by multiplying the second column n's of i or particle count with the third column d's of i or the midpoint of the size interval to obtain the product n's of i times d's of i. And we do this for each size range and at the bottom of this column we can add up all the n's of i times d's of i terms. We can now go to the next slide where we use this information to calculate the arithmetic mean d hat. Using the formula that I described earlier, the arithmetic mean can be calculated as 142 nanometers. The median diameter can also be calculated very simply. As we see, there are 832 particles in all, and the median diameter is the middle particle. If we can line up these 832 particles in ascending order, then in fact there are two middle particles, the 416th and 417th particle. And so we should take the average of these two middle particles. However, since we don't know the sizes of the individual particles, we can at best say that the median is somewhere between 50 and 80 nanometers. Next, we have to calculate the standard deviation. We can now look at the fifth column, and this column shows the product of n's of i and d's of i minus d hat squared. And at the bottom of this column, we can add up all these product terms. Now we go to the next slide again and look where we use this summation in the formula for the standard deviation. We take the summation and divide it by capital N minus 1 or 832 minus 1 and then take the square root of this whole quantity. This gives us a standard deviation of 186 nanometers. While the calculations we did for the mean, median and standard deviation are useful to some extent, they do not give us a feel for the shape of the distribution. We can construct a histogram of these data as shown in the figure. Here the particle diameter is on the horizontal x-axis and the particle count is on the vertical y-axis. This histogram gives us a better sense of how the particles are distributed among the various size ranges, that is the shape of the distribution. However, this type of a plot has an inherent limitation in that the shape of the histogram depends very much on the size ranges that we choose. For example, we could combine the ranges 140 to 270 nanometers and 270 to 560 nanometers to form a new size range 140 to 560 nanometers with 96 plus 53 or 149 particles. I am showing the original and the modified histogram here. And we see that the height of this new size interval that we have created is much greater than either of the original two size intervals. Our histogram's shape now looks different. The shape of our distribution should not depend on the size intervals in our instrument. It should not depend on the instrument design. This is not acceptable. To avoid this kind of a problem, we can calculate the particle count per nanometer as shown in the fourth column. We are dividing the count in each size range by the width of that size range, and so we end up with a count per nanometer column. So this is our second try at drawing a useful histogram. The advantage of this type of histogram is that the interval heights are independent of the size interval. Additionally, since the height of each block or rectangle is ends of i divided by delta d, which is the interval size, 
and the width is the interval size delta D, the area of each block of the histogram is equal to the number of particles or ends of I in that size range. Therefore, the total area of all the blocks of the histogram is equal to the total number of particles, that is the sum of ends of I or capital N. Well, I'm still not satisfied. One drawback to this type of a histogram is that the heights of the intervals are still dependent on the number of particles collected in that particular sample. So if we had collected twice the number of particles, but with the same distribution in the various bins, as shown in the histogram on the bottom, the heights of our intervals would have been doubled, leaving the shape unchanged. So let us make one more adjustment. We can calculate the fraction of particles per nanometer in each size interval instead of the absolute number of particles per nanometer. The fifth column in this table shows the fraction of particles per nanometer in each size interval. We obtain this by dividing the fourth column, which shows the count per nanometer, by the total number of particles, that is 832. So now let us try the histogram one more time. In this histogram, the area of each rectangular block is equal to the fraction of particles in that size interval. Therefore, the total area of all the blocks combined is equal to 1. This histogram can be said to be independent of the type of sampling instrument we use that defines the size of our bins and also the number of particles we happened to collect. It is more representative of the distribution of particles in the environment independent of our instrument and sampling conditions. If we want, we can do one more thing. We can draw a smooth curve through the midpoints of the tops of the rectangular blocks to obtain a particle size distribution curve. This is an approximation to what is called the probability density function. Just like the sums of the areas of all the rectangles in the histogram is 1, the area under the curve of the probability density function is also 1. We can now take a closer look at this histogram and we see that the histogram has a skewed shape. Particles appear to be distributed in a skewed manner and there are more particles in the smaller size ranges than in the larger size ranges. And it is important to note that the x-axis, or the horizontal axis, is a linear scale. However, if we change the horizontal axis from a linear to a logarithmic scale, the particle distribution appears to be more symmetric. We can fit a symmetrical looking curve to the tops of the histogram. This brings us to what we call log normal distributions. Aerosol size distributions are seldom symmetrical. They are typically positively skewed with a long tail to the right. While the frequency distributions of particle sizes have a skewed shape, the log of the particle sizes often have a symmetrical or Gaussian or normal distribution. Thus, the particle sizes are said to be log normally distributed. And the log normal distribution is a good way to describe particle size distributions in workplaces as well as in ambient environments. The statistics of log normal distributions are very similar to what we have done before. The log normal distribution is described by the geometric mean and geometric standard deviation. This is analogous to the arithmetic mean and standard deviation that we have learned to calculate earlier. The geometric mean diameter, d of g, can be calculated as shown in this formula. And you can see that this is similar to the formula for the arithmetic mean, except that the diameter is replaced with the log of diameter. The geometric standard deviation, sigmas of g, 
is calculated as shown in this formula and you can see that this is similar to the formula for the standard deviation except that the diameter is replaced with the log of diameter. We can further modify this equation using one of the rules of logarithms that is that the difference between the logarithms of two quantities is the logarithm of the ratio of those two quantities. Log of di minus log of dg is equal to the log of di divided by dg. Thus both of these expressions are similar to that for the arithmetic mean and standard deviation except that the diameter is replaced with the log of diameter. The geometric mean and geometric standard deviation completely describe a log normal distribution. The geometric mean is a central measure of the size of the aerosol and the geometric standard deviation is a measure of the variability of particle sizes in the aerosol. And while the geometric mean has units of diameter, the geometric standard deviation is a ratio of two diameters and therefore it is dimensionless. It cannot take a value of zero since the particle size cannot be zero. We can use what we just learned to calculate the geometric mean and geometric standard deviation for our data set. The first three columns are the same as before. The third column shows the midpoints of the size intervals. But since for log normal calculations, we need to use the log of diameter, the fourth column is the logarithm of the midpoint diameters, or log of di. And the fifth column is obtained by multiplying the second column ends up i with the fourth column log of di to obtain the product ends of i times log of di. And at the bottom of this column, we can add up all the ends of i times log of di across all the size bins. We can now go to the next slide where we use this information to calculate log of d's of g. And for our data set, we calculate log of d's of g to be equal to 1.96. Then we can exponentiate it, or in other words, calculate 10 raised to the power 1.96, and this comes out to be 92. So our geometric mean diameter is 92 nanometers. We now go back to the previous slide and look at the sixth column. This column shows the product of ends of i and log of di minus log of dg squared. And we calculate this for each size interval. And at the bottom of this column, we obtain the sum of all these terms across each size interval. We now go back to the next slide where we use this summation in the formula for the standard deviation as shown below. We take the summation and divide it by n minus 1 or 832 minus 1 and then we take the square root of this quantity. This gives us a standard deviation of 2.29. At this point we should remember that for this very data set, we had calculated an arithmetic mean of 142 nanometers. And now we see that the geometric mean is 92 nanometers. This is a defining characteristic of log normal distributions that are skewed in that their arithmetic means are always greater than their geometric means. We can also plot the cumulative distribution of the particles. Here, the first two columns in the table are the same as in previous slides, and the third column shows the cumulative count up to a given particle size. So we can read this column in the following way. There are 120 particles less than 50 nanometers. There are 120 plus 380 or 500 particles less than 80 nanometers. There are 120 plus 380 plus 146 
or 646 particles less than 140 nanometers, and so on. Finally, there are 832 particles, that is all the particles, are less than 1260 nanometers. We can now construct a fourth column which shows the cumulative percentage. Here, 14% of the particles, that is 120 out of the 832 particles, are less than 50 nanometers. 60% of the particles are less than 80 nanometers. And so this corresponds to 500 out of the 832 particles. And finally, 100% of the particles, it's all 832 particles, are less than 1,260 nanometers. These data can be plotted as shown in the figure on this slide. On the horizontal axis, we again have particle diameter on a linear scale, and the vertical axis contains the cumulative percentage, again on a linear scale. When the x-axis is a linear scale, the cumulative distribution rises and then levels off at 100%. Nothing remarkable. This is to be expected. However, there is a different way of plotting the same data. We can plot the diameter on a logarithmic scale and the cumulative fraction on a probability scale. And this is called a log probability plot. And the figure on this slide is an example of the log probability plot. The particle size on the vertical axis is on a logarithmic scale the particle sizes go from 10 to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 nanometers in equal intervals. The horizontal axis is on a probability scale, and the intervals on this scale are wider at either end and more compressed in the middle of the range. The lower end does not go to zero but approaches zero, and the upper end does not reach 100%, but approaches 100%. If we plot the cumulative fraction data on such a graph, the data approximately fall on a straight line. We can draw a best fit line through the data points. The fact that all the data fall on a straight line indicates that the data come from a log normal distribution. That is the characteristic of the log probability plot, that if we have a log normal distribution, then the cumulative percentage plot will fall on a straight line. From this plot, we can read off important statistical parameters of the log normal distribution. The median diameter is at the 50th percentile that is, 50% of the particles are less than this diameter, and this corresponds to the 50th percentage point on the cumulative percentage axis. This corresponds to the geometric mean diameter. The geometric standard deviation, which is a measure of the variability or the spread of the distribution, is defined as the ratio of the 84th percentile to the 50th percentile. For this particular data set, the geometric mean diameter, which corresponds to the 50th cumulative percentage point, is 95 nanometers, as shown here. And the geometric standard deviation is the ratio of the 84th percentile diameter to the 50th percentile diameter. This is equal to 240 nanometers divided by 95 nanometers. And this is equal to 2.5. So the geometric standard deviation is 2.5 in this case. Now, if you remember, we had also calculated the geometric mean and geometric standard deviation using table calculations. And we obtained a value of 92 nanometers for the geometric mean and 2.29 for the geometric standard deviation. As we see, the two sets of values one obtained through tabular calculations and the other one obtained graphically are very similar to each other, as we should expect. 
But the graphical method is far simpler, provided, of course, that you have a log probability graph on a spreadsheet. We had discussed earlier that the geometric standard deviation is a dimensionless number as it is the ratio of two diameters. In the graphical method, we determine it by the ratio of the 84th to the 50th percentile. Since the 84th percentile can never be less than the 50th percentile, it follows that the geometric standard deviation can never be less than 1. In fact, the smallest value that the geometric standard deviation can take is 1. And this happens when all the particles in an aerosol have the same exact diameter. That is, it is a monodisperse aerosol. In this case, the 84th percentile is the same as the 50th percentile and every other percentile for that matter. The larger the geometric standard deviation, the more variability there is in particle size. The concentration of an aerosol can be expressed in several different ways. First, we can express it as the number of particles per cubic meter of air, or n, as shown in the first row of this table. If we have particles of diameter d expressed in units of nanometers, we can also calculate the total surface area of all the particles with this diameter as n times pi times the square of the diameter, where pi times the square of the diameter is the surface area of one particle, assuming that the particles are spherical. This is the surface area concentration in nanometer squared per cubic meter of air. We can calculate the volume of these particles as n times pi times the cube of the diameter divided by 6. This is the volume concentration in nanometer cubed per cubic meter of air. We can also multiply the volume concentration by the density of the particles in the appropriate units to get a mass concentration in milligrams per cubic meter of air. In this instance, the density of the particles is expressed in milligrams per nanometer cubed for the units to come out right. We can apply the relationships described in the previous slide to each size bin in the particle count table we encountered earlier. The top histogram is the same as before, except that instead of plotting particle count in each size bin on the vertical axis, we are showing the count fraction in each particle size range divided by the width of the size range on a log scale. We can take the midpoint of each size interval to be the representative diameter for all the particles in that size interval. This diameter can then be used to convert count in that size range to either surface area or volume using the relationships shown in the previous slide. Even though the size bin 50 to 80 nanometers has the most number of particles. These particles contribute very little to the surface area and almost none to the volume. Even though there are very few number of particles in the size bin 890 to 1260 nanometers, these particles contribute a disproportionate amount to the surface area and volume. This is because the surface area is proportional to the diameter squared, and the volume is proportional to the diameter cubed. And so we see that the histograms change in their shape as we go from a histogram based on particle count to one based on surface area to one based on volume of the particles. This slide shows the type of size distribution by mass that we can expect from some of the activities we have discussed earlier. For instance, we saw a video of a worker using a saw to cut a concrete block. This is a mechanical operation, and as we have discussed earlier, we expect to see a coarse dust being generated. 
The histogram on the left shows the particle mass distribution as a function of aerodynamic diameter. Particles between roughly 2 to 20 micrometers contributed most to the mass of the aerosol. The histogram on the right is typical of the scenario when diesel operated machinery is used to haul crushed coal as we saw on the second video. The diesel exhaust contributes particles between roughly 0.1 to 0.5 micrometers, while the coal dust contributes the most mass from particles between roughly 1 to 20 micrometers. This is referred to as a bimodal distribution and reflects contributions to particle mass from two aerosol sources. In the next segment of this module, we will discuss the various elements of an aerosol sampling system and various sampling strategies. At the bottom of the slide, we can see schematically the components of an aerosol sampling system. A particle laden air is drawn through a sampling inlet. Unlike when we sample for gases and vapors, the design of the aerosol sampling inlet ensures that only a specific size range of particles is sampled. The aerosol then passes through a transport section where some of the aerosol may be lost. This could be something as simple as a length of duct or a tube where particles may deposit and may not make it to the measurement zone. The aerosol then enters the sensing zone or collection medium which captures the particles or measures some relevant property. This can be a filter that collects airborne dust that can then be analyzed by microscopy, gravimetry, or other chemical means. It can also be a zone through which the aerosol moves and interacts, for example, with a light beam, and in the process, some optical property gets sensed. Other elements of our sampling system include a flow measurement device and the pump for forcing the air through the system. Even though there are a wide array of aerosol measuring instruments, they all share this basic overall configuration. Depending on the reasons for sampling and instrument design, several sampling strategies can be employed. Active versus passive sampling, area versus personal sampling, and grab sampling versus integrated sampling. In active sampling, the aerosol is drawn in through a pump onto a collection medium. That is, an external source of energy is needed to move the air through the sampling train. The photograph on the left shows aerosol samplers on a rooftop. Air is drawn through the sampling inlet using an electrical pump. And we can see electrical wires coming out of the pumps being connected to outlets for power supply. The photograph on the right shows a person wearing a sampler connected to a battery operated pump. The battery is typically low power and hence only a small flow rate of air can be drawn using this pump compared to the pumps on the left. In passive sampling, aerosol particles are transported by gravity, diffusion and inertia onto the sampling surface. There is no external power source. The passive sampler shown in this photograph is just a metal stub onto which particles deposit. The deposited particles can then be analyzed by various analytical techniques, for example, microscopy. Area sampling is done to determine general background environmental conditions. These samplers on a rooftop sample the air in the Twin Cities and provide a measure of the background aerosol concentration in the Twin Cities metro area. In contrast, personal sampling is done to determine the personal exposure of workers to aerosol by monitoring their breathing zone concentration. In this photograph, you see an aerosol sampler which is attached to a pump and the sampler is drawing air from the same general region of air from which the person is breathing. And this volume is called the breathing zone of this person. Another technique that is commonly being used 
is to videotape a worker or a person carrying out a series of tasks and then overlay on it the real-time measurements made by an instrument. In this photograph, we see a worker on the left-hand side doing various tasks. And on the right-hand side, we see the time trace of the exposure measured by a real-time instrument. And by focusing on the peaks, we know which tasks contribute more to the exposure. And this helps us focus our resources on addressing those particular tasks for added attention. Time averaging is an important concept. Samples are collected over a period of time and represent an average over that time interval. In this graph, we show a time trace, that is, the concentration as a function of time over a time interval from zero to capital T. If we obtain a sample over a very short time interval, it's from T1 to T2, we refer to that as a grab sample, and the grab sample is an average over that time interval, T1 to T2. It is defined as the integral of the concentration, capital C, as a function of time over the time interval, T1 to T2. Then we can divide this integral by the length of the time interval, T2 minus T1. Thus, it represents an average concentration over a very small time interval, for example, just a few minutes. In integrated sampling, the contaminant is collected over a much longer period of time, zero to capital T, for example. It could be an entire work shift or an entire day. It represents an average concentration over this entire time period. The integral in both these equations is the area under the curve over the specific time interval, T1 to T2 in the case of grab sampling, and 0 to capital T in the case of integrated sampling. The concentration can also be expressed as the mass of contaminant collected divided by the sampling flow rate times the sampling time, capital T. In the case of grab sampling, the amount of mass collected is small, and hence grab sampling can only be used for identifying the contaminants rather than detailed quantification of the mass. In integrated sampling, however, we can typically collect a sufficient amount of contaminant for quantitative assessment. To summarize this module, an aerosol is a suspension of liquid or solid particles in a gas with sizes between 0.001 micrometer or 1 nanometer and 100 to 200 micrometers. The sizes of aerosol particles depend on the type of process generating them. Typically, nucleation and combustion processes generate ultrafine and fine particles, while mechanical processes generate coarse particles. Particles come in a range of shapes. Depending on the property of the aerosol we are interested in, we can define several equivalent diameters to size particles. Histograms can be useful in studying the size distribution of particles in an aerosol. Plotting cumulative distributions on log probability axis is an efficient way of determining the geometric mean and geometric standard deviation of a particle size distribution. There are many sampling strategies that can be used based on the reasons for sampling. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training, METFAST program, a collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. Funding for the METFAST program is provided by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences of the National Institute of Health under award number R25ES023595. The content of this lesson is solely the responsibility of the developers 
and does not necessarily represent the official views of the National Institutes of Health. Thank you.